My name is Danielle Draymond and I'm Toledo Woodcraft's demonstrator for chip carving. Today I'm going to talk about not only how to lay out your board and some of the elementary chips, but also the types of wood, knife choice, measuring tools, and several other things in between. Some of the pieces that I'm laying out here are, were made by my grandfather, Jim Herner, and he's the one who got me interested in this hobby. And at first, I didn't think this is something that I could do, but over time, I was able to learn it, and it didn't take long at all. So I'm hoping that after today's demonstration, I'll increase your interest in chip carving and motivate you to start a project of your own. I want to preface that this demonstration is one perspective. You'll find that there is more than one way to do everything that I've prepared to discuss in today's demonstration. And as you start a project of your own, you may find that a different way of carving, sharpening, and tool choice may work better for you. I want to emphasize that anyone can learn how to do this. When my grandfather Jim Herner showed me how to chip carve, he also introduced me to the works of Mr. Wayne Barton. Wayne Barton is one of the most renowned chip carvers in the world, and many of his designs and patterns will be shown throughout this demonstration. I recommend obtaining a copy of the Complete Guide to Chip Carving. I found it a helpful resource to have on hand. In addition to his comprehensive guide, he's written several other books detailing techniques and patterns, including how to lay out your project. My grandfather and I are huge fans of his designs, and he also lays out a few alphabets that you can use and resize for various projects. Please note that Mr. Barton's carving technique is a little different from the way I carve, so I recommend observing some of his work too if you get a chance. If you're interested in a couple resource books to help you get started, I would get the Complete Guide to Chip Carving, but also the Chip Carver's Workbook by Mr. Dennis Moore. Both books have excellent photographs to go with their explanations, and they're a great resource to have on hand as you explore the world of chip carving. In regards to chip carving knives, you'll find that one or two is all you really need to do all of the work. This is a tool roll I made to carry just about everything I would typically use for carving. I think the hardest part about chip carving is choosing a knife that you're comfortable with using. Sometimes it takes a few tries to determine which is the right fit for you, and to be honest with you, there are hundreds of different types of carving knives out there. You can select not only based on the, the blade, but also its handle. Woodcraft carries a beginner set containing three knives and polishing compound manufactured by FlexCut. I have some examples of John Dunkel and Bruce Nicholas knives, but ultimately I found a knife that my grandfather had given me the most comfortable to use and have been using since for the majority of my carvings. Wayne Barton has also produced a, a chip carving knife and a stab knife that he uses for all of his work and I found that several knife manufacturers use a very similar knife design for their carving knives as well. The second most important item you're going to need for this hobby is a sharpening stone. In this case, I use a Spiderico ceramic stone. It's made of high alumina ceramic, which doesn't require lubricants such as oil or water for use. The dark side of the stone is a medium grit, which is effective at removing material and reshaping the bevel of a dull cutting tool. The white side is a fine grit, which is used to tighten the scratch pattern, creating a razor sharp edge. Although you can comfortably get by with a sharpening stone, I find that using a slip strop and gold compound is very handy after I sharpen my knife because it helps polish the blade. If your knife is polished, it'll cut smoother into the wood. I keep a piece of sandpaper, 220 grit, close by when I prep my board. I found using anything less than 220 grit would actually leave scratch marks in the wood. And when you lay your board out, graphite gets caught in those scratches, which makes it very challenging to remove later. It can unfortunately lead to drastic measures in regards to trying to remove those lines after you finish carving. And you can actually damage what you're trying to work on. Prepping the surface with fine grit sandpaper makes it easier to lay out the design and remove pencil or graphite marks when you're finished. Pencils are a must and there are different schools of thought in regards to which type of pencil to use. In Dennis Moore's Chip Carver's workbook, he goes in great detail on which type of lead to use, which I found very helpful. He also recommends using a mechanical pencil because it gives you nice thin lines. But my eyes aren't that great and I tend to favor slightly larger lines and for that purpose I really like using Ticonderoga pencils. 
They sharpen nice, leave nice dark marks, and they erase great. I also like to keep gum ha erasers handy. They work well when removing graphite from the project. I also keep a small brush available because sometimes the chips, there's little pieces of chips that get stuck into the board and you can't always simply just blow them out. In addition, when you do a lot of erasing, the rubbings from the eraser will also stick to your board and having a nice soft bristled brush is, is handy to have to remove all of that. I also try to keep a small ruler that has both inches and centimeters on it and a small compass available for my layout. A small T-square or combination square is invaluable in laying out lines on your boards. As I mentioned earlier, I use a Spiderico ceramic stone for sharpening. You can find these at Woodcraft. I'm going to demonstrate how I sharpen my knives, but please know that sharpening is a diverse topic amongst carvers, and you may find a different approach is most appropriate for you. I begin by testing the blade on my thumbnail, and trust me when I say that this does not hurt at all. If I run this across my thumbnail and it doesn't try to bite into it, it's dull. But if it tries to dig into the nail, it's sharp and ready to go. So to demonstrate, I start at the top of the nail and it's trying to dig right into my thumbnail so I know that this is sharp and ready to go. I'm going to continue with this demonstration so that you see how I sharpen my tools. Even though the sharpening stone has a medium and fine grit, you'll find that you'll hardly use the medium grit if you sharpen regularly. The medium grit is used for shaping and sharpening the blade, but the fine side is used for polishing the blade and keeping that edge freshly sharp. How often you need to sharpen will solely depend on how much you carve and the wood you choose to carve in. And if you find that at any point your knife is slipping as you're carving, odds are you are due to sharpen your knife. To sharpen my knife, I lay the blade flat and I'll go back and forth several times. I'll flip the blade around and I'll do the same thing again. I try not to raise the blade at any angle because I don't want to introduce a new bevel which will negatively impact how the knife carves in the future. And depending on the knife you use, you may not be able to run it across flat. Sometimes you have to put it at an angle. For an example, the Barton carving knife requires you raise hit the chip carving knife back edge 10 degrees, which is roughly the width of a U.S. dime. In reality, this is all you need to sharpen your knife, but I actually like to add an extra step. I really like using a slip strop with gold compound because it helps polish that knife further. To use this, you would rub your strop compound on both sides of your slip strop. I don't do the whole thing because my blade isn't long enough to reach the center of this, but if I were to use a whittling knife or a, a non-chip carving knife that has a longer blade, that would be a good time to fill the entire slip strop with the flex compound. After I put a sufficient amount on, I start stropping. I take your, you take your knife and you set it at one end. You're going to pull away from your, from your sharp edge. Flip it around and do it again and you'll do this several times. And I know it's probably difficult to see on this demonstration, but as you're doing this, you're going to see this really polished mirror finish on your blade, and that's how you know it's ready to go. When I finish sharpening, I test the blade on my fingernail to make sure it bites. But in this case, I knew it was already sharp, so I won't do that again. I often use a scrap piece of wood to test a few cuts before returning to my project and I know you're probably not going to be able to see the, the cuts very clear in this part of the demonstration because the camera is not close enough. Um, please trust that it's cutting beautifully across the grain and I know I'm rotating my board and I'll go into details on why I do that but I like to do cuts similar to what I plan on doing on my actual project. It helps me get a feel for what I, how I have to hold my knife and how to be consistent with those cuts. And if I'm cutting easily here after having sharpened my knife, I know I'm ready to go. So you have your tools, your knife is sharp, it's time to pick out your wood. Wood choice is very important. 
When selecting a piece, you need to consider both the hardness and the grain. If there's a specific look you're going for that requires a denser wood, you may have to sacrifice the intricacy of your design because it's challenged to do intricate work on hardwoods with greater wood densities. In this instance, using a less dense wood and then staining when you're finished may be an appealing option. But I recommend testing the stain on a scrap or a practice board before you start carving. Hardwoods with greater density like oak, maple, cherry, and black walnut are particularly difficult to carve with carving knives alone and sometimes require chisels and mallets depending on your design. The grain alone could compete with your overall design as well. You want a wood with a firm and tight straight grain. It is fairly common and inexpensive and is easily carved with a knife. Most carvers favor basswood because it has all of these qualities. Basswood is a hardwood and very easy to carve. And its color will range from a pale cream as shown here to a yellowish brown. Oiling your project when you're finished helps highlight the shadowing of the chips and enriches the natural color of the wood. The texture of the wood is uniform, which is ideal because the grain will compete with the overall design of your carving and will increase visual appeal. Another favorite is butternut. The heartwood is light brown with some darker brown streaks. And if you choose to stain your butternut project, it can be made to resemble other hardwoods such as black walnut, oak, and cherry. Butternut is also considered a hardwood but is also very easy to carve into. And I have a couple of examples of butternut here. The cross is a Wayne Barton design carved into butternut my grandfather carved years ago, but it was stained to look more like cherry. In addition, the round design I show, I'm showing here has also been carved in butternut, but as you can see, I've added oil to this compared to the blank board. The blank board is a lighter color. Once you selected the wood board you plan to use, you'll want to assure that you have a smooth surface. This will make it easier to not only lay out your design, but also to remove your unwanted lines after carving. I use a 220 grit sandpaper. You won't need a finer grit for this, but I would not venture any coarser grades because they can end up scratching the wood itself, and once the graphite gets into those scratches, it's a real challenge to remove them. The next thing you want to be thinking about is the direction of the grain on your board. Ideally, you want the majority of your cuts to line up with the grain. You'll find that carving with the grain is a lot easier than cutting against it. And sometimes you're limited to the board you have and this can't always be helped in regards to your design. But where it can, it's worth paying attention to. A really good example of this can be seen with my wedding plate. I have it zoomed in so hopefully you can see the lines going across that represent the grain. My grandfather carved Wayne Barton's Kissing Birds pattern on its center and you'll see that the wings of the birds are where the, your largest cuts reside and that they're parallel with the grain of the wood. I also want to draw your attention to the borders of the plate. You can see that space was left between the edge of the border and the edge of the plate as shown here. This was done on purpose and it gives it a more purposeful and planned design. Purposely factoring an edge is something you need to consider when laying out a board. If you don't give enough space between the true edge of the board and the edge of your design, your finished project may look cluttered as though you ran out of room. At this point, I'm ready to draw a vertical and horizontal line centered on the board as well as the edge lines. From this point forward, the layout is derived from the center lines. To do the edge, I normally go at least a quarter of an inch around the full perimeter of the board. In the example I'm showing you, I elected to follow Wayne Barton's suggestion of leaving 12 millimeters of space from the edge. For the purpose of this demonstration, I wanted to create a pattern board that contains different examples of the borders that can be done using a simple three-sided or triangle chip. Two millimeters from your edge, you'll draw a line. And then after that, you'll draw two more lines four millimeters apart and then finally another two millimeter line. Using your small T-square or a combination square is ideal when laying these lines out. For this example, I spaced the horizontal grids 
apart at 12 millimeters to mimic the border. A pattern board is a great exercise to do because once it's finished, you can use it as a template to select borders from when planning future projects. To make the triangle chips, you want to draw vertical lines from the 4 millimeter sections of the grid 4 millimeters apart. So that's right here. You've got your 4 millimeter sections and you're going to draw vertical lines 4 millimeters apart. In regards to the center lines, I only drew a vertical line here because of the demonstration being based off of drawing borders. It's not an actual board where you're going to transfer a design in the center of it. In the example I have here, I show what the grid looks like in the top border. I also drew a couple more sets with positive and negative diamonds. When you choose a design to carve, you often have a choice of whether you want your final product to have a positive or negative image. In regards to this example, a positive image is achieved when you remove the chips around the design. In this case, it's the diamonds. The shaded regions on my board are the regions that I'm going to ultimately be removing when I go to start carving. In the negative image, the diamonds themselves are removed. If you look closely, you'll see the diamonds are made up of three-sided or triangle chips. By doing the same chip at different configurations, you can come up with at least a half a dozen different borders. And in addition to the positive and negative diamond borders, I've also laid out a zigzag pattern, pyramid, double diamond, and flower patterns. So at this point, you can see the zigzag pattern, the pyramid pattern, and the double diamond, and this is the flower pattern. The double diamond and the flower patterns are actually derivations of the positive diamond pattern. You'll remove the chips the same way, you lay the board out the same way, but after you remove these initial chips, you'll do additional cutting work in the centers, in the case of the double diamond, and crossways on the positive image of the diamond to make the flower. I like to shade the chips I want to remove to prevent me from accidentally removing a portion that was meant to stay on the board. Once the center lines and the border is laid out, I work to transfer my design onto the wood. Remember to work from the center lines out. Depending on the design, you may be able to manually draw using a compass or freehand, but I typically like to use graphite paper or I'll shade the back of the page and then trace over the design. You don't want to use carbon paper because it leaves a residue that you can't erase. You'll get an absolutely beautiful transfer with incredibly dark lines using it, but it's next to impossible to remove residual markings that you didn't carve out and that can lead you to inadvertently damage your project trying to remove them. Um, sometimes you may be tempted to use sandpaper which can also embed this in the lines into the wood and it takes away that crispness or the sharp edges of your carving so I recommend not doing that either. I find that when I shade the back of the design and trace it onto the board I'll go back to the board with a pencil and trace over areas that were too light from the transfer. And before I do the tracing, I'll take a piece of tissue and I'll rub the back of the design to remove any loose graphite from the pencil I used to shade with it. It prevents excess lead from smearing or embedding into the wood. The pro to this is that since you're using a pencil for the entire layout process, you know you can erase anything you need to easily. Graphite paper is also very nice to use, but not all graphite paper is created equal. It would be worth your time to test it on a practice board or a scrap piece of wood just to see how easy it is to erase. You'll want to line the design up with the center lines and tape it down before tracing. So as you can see here, I've got two that I've already prepped. There's two tulips. This one here has graphite paper underneath it. And this one here is a piece that I shaded the back of the design with a regular number two pencil. I like to use artist tape because it doesn't typically leave a residue on the board when I pull it back up. Masking tape has a similar effect. And I try to use as little of the tape as possible because it's capable of lifting some of the pencil markings off the board. 
at this point I'll take I'll take a pencil and then I will trace over the designs and I've already done that so at this point I can remove the tape here and I should have two nice designs sometimes when you're choosing to shade the back of the design like I did here even if you take a tissue and kind of rub off that excess graphite you can still get some lead that that kind of smears on and that's not a problem at all you can take your eraser and wipe that out you'll also notice between the two they're very similar as far as laying out I would say that the graphite paper is a little bit more definitive than this but you'll both both of these are perfectly acceptable to use in regards to carving so go ahead and experiment with this at this point you've learned how to select wood for a project check the grain direction and lay out lines pertaining to the edges board center and borders you've also been introduced to positive and negative images and the three-sided or triangle chip and how to transfer a design to your board. Now we're ready to carve. On this example, I laid out four millimeter blocks to do the triangle chips. You can find that you can do a lot of very beautiful borders with a simple triangle chip. I start by angling my knife 65 degrees and applying more pressure as I move across the line, tapering out by the time I reach the end of the line. What I'm going to do is several cuts across the same edge across the board before rotating my board and doing the same cut along the other diagonal. Getting the right angle will take a little practice at first, but it won't take long to get a feel for how to comfortably angle your knife as you're going. So I'm going to demonstrate it as follows. We're going to work on a zigzag pattern. I'm choosing to go consistently through this angle and I'm going to follow this all the way down to the center line. Because I rotate my board when I go to do a, each angle, it's a bit more efficient to do a number of cuts at the same time. This is also really good because you develop muscle memory as you go along and you get a feel for how to comfortably hold your knife and you get that angle you need when you're carving. Now I rotate my board because I don't trust myself to flip my wrist to do the back cuts. It feels unnatural to me and I find that the cuts that I make aren't necessarily uniform. So I'll rotate my board to do the diagonals and so that my hand is comfortable each time I make my cut. Throughout this whole process it's important to make yourself comfortable because you'll be sitting here quite a while doing it and before you know it time's passed. When I dig in I kind of taper in and I taper out. And I do this to try to minimize the chance of undercutting into an area I'm going to remove and then pulling off extra material. I do the flat cut last. And when you do that last cut in the ideal situation you're going to hear a little pop and I'm not sure if you're going to hear it on this demonstra in this demonstration but it's a great sound once you develop a rhythm. Sometimes the chip itself will just pop right out of the board and other times it's going to do what it's doing right here and it's going to sit in place and that's okay. It's important not to take your knife and try to pry those chips out because what you'll end up what will end up happening is that you're going to have um, an unclean pop and it's going it may pull out extra material. So what I like to do a lot of times is is kind of feel around and feel where that 
fiber is still connected. I'll start from the beginning and I'll go and retrace my steps. And a lot of times it'll pop out. Sometimes you can blow the chips out as they pop. Other times you can use your brush and brush the loose chips away. This will let you know whether you need to go back in with your knife to kind of clean up. So I don't know how well you're going to be able to see, but this particular well here still has a chip in the center of it. And so I just want to take my knife and lay it along the edge of my chip so that only the I, I'm only using the point of my knife and I'm sorry if this isn't super clear to see and this will, I promise you this will be much easier once you're doing this yourself and sometimes it's, it's helpful to have a light I like using an LED light when I carve but in this particular instance I'm not able to use it because it puts too much glare on the board and I, then you can't see anything Ideally, as you develop a rhythm, you only need one pass to get all these chips pop hopped out. I think the trouble I'm having is I don't have the board closer to me, and I want to make sure that you can actually see the chips. But as you can see here, I was able to pull off the triangle chips, and it really wasn't challenging even if it did take me more than one pass to do. As you continue working on this, you'll see that it comes much easier. So I'm going to demonstrate this again. I do one side first, just to make sure I'm consistent with how I'm cutting. And then I rotate my board. Sometimes it's tempting to rotate your wrist and some carvers are able to do it really well. I'm not one of them. So I like to rotate the board so that I can keep the same angle as I'm cutting, a, cutting across. Let's come back here. This is where it's really handy to shade the chips you want to remove. It makes the carving a little bit more efficient. Not that it's erased by any means. Take your time. When you start carving the last side of your chip, you'll know you did it when you hear a pop sound. And I'm not sure you're not gonna, you're going to be able to hear it on this video, but you start hearing the wood releasing and you get all these nice little chips out.
and ideally one pass on each side is all you're going to need and as you develop a rhythm it, it'll come easier and it's very tempting to take your knife and try to pull these off but you, you don't really want to do it because there may still be some fibers stuck in there and you could accidentally remove extra wood that you didn't mean to but a lot of times what I like to do is, is take my knife and feel where it's still stuck and I'll rotate my board to just kind of retrace those steps and you know you've hit it when you hear that popping sound sometimes the chip will pop out entirely like this one just did I like using a small brush or, you know, blow the chips out when possible. Try to make sure you can still see this. Okay. So at the end of all this, you have a nice zigzag pattern. And you can always go back in and clean up the chips that didn't fully pop out. As you develop a rhythm, it really starts to come out cleanly. And you just go in with your knife and just kind of, you don't want to angle it so that you get a deeper cut but you kind of want to trace along what you've already carved because it might just take the tip of your blade to, to encourage those last little bits of chips to pop out. And there you've got a zigzag pattern. Next, I want to show you how to remove larger chips. There are times when a chip is too large to remove in a single pass, and it's sometimes tempting to approach it the same way you would a smaller chip, but by doing so it can make the cut too deep or too shallow because you'll be angling your knife differently in efforts to remove that larger chip. And if you're too aggressive, the angle of your knife will be too steep, which then leads to removing more material than intended you'll end up with a design that doesn't have uniform chip depth. The goal is to remain consistent with your knife angle the entire time you're removing chips. And if you have a particularly busy design, you could also remove wood from adjacent areas if you make your cuts too deep. The answer to this is to make a smaller chip in the center of the area you want to clear. This gives the fibers around it a place to move once you remove the rest of the wood. Even using this method could lead to deep cuts, so this takes a bit of practice. In the example I have here, I have a thistle from Wayne Barton's Complete Guide to Chip Carving that I wanted to incorporate into a design, but I've never done it before, so I transferred the image to a practice board using graphite paper. When I transferred the design onto my basswood board, I aligned the thistle to go with the grain, since most of my chips are associated with the petals. The leaves are going to be cut across the grain. I started off okay, but as I started targeting the larger sections, I found myself removing chips that weren't as clean, and that's because I angled my knife too steep and was taking out way more material than I needed to. The process of cleaning up the chips added to the error because I was then removing even more material on top of that. Thankfully, I didn't distort the image too much, and I'm still happy with how it turned out, but I know that I'm going to need a bit more practice before incorporating this design into a project. To remove the large chips, I needed to make the smaller chip within the design shallow. So if this center petal right here is my large chip, I'm going to start my cut in the center about four millimeters away from the edge here. 
and come around and remove a shallower chip. Then I come out to the edge here and repeat. By doing it this way, I'm taking off that top layer and releasing that, um, that wood from the chip, which will allow the wood on the outer edge a place to go when I start uh, cutting that part out. So if we go and look at another pattern, and I'm going to zoom in a little bit to make it a little bit easier to see the image. Wayne Barton's flower petal pattern is another that requires large chip removal. The flower petal design shown here has a layered appearance and when I approach this design I make the initial chip and then I follow along the line the chip was made against. Since the chips are so close together, a stacking approach is appropriate. Stacking is a method that minimizes the chance of removing wood not intended to be removed. Specifically, you don't want to bring all of your chips down to the same point when several chips come together. If you do, you risk undercutting into adjacent chips, and as you move around the pattern, you can lift out wood that was meant to stay in place. So what I mean by that is if you look at this particular design as an example. I have eight petals coming down to this very center point. The temptation is to follow these lines and carve right within them to the point where I get to that center. But it would be a bad idea because if I brought all eight of these petals straight down here, odds are at some point the tip of my blade while cutting underneath this wood here is going to cross the, these ridges. And when that happens, the next cut you make can actually lift all of that material out. So what you'll end up with is a hole. So the stacking method suggests that you, bring, you can bring a chip down to the point, but the adjacent ones, you want to stop just shy of it. And since this image has all of these ridges coming to the same place, your eyes aren't going to realize that every single petal isn't quite making it there. And I'll show you a finished one to prove that point. So by stopping just shy of it, you're saving the wood in the center from being accidentally removed during the process of your carving. Another common question is how to determine which order you should remove your chips. This is particularly important when doing a design that has chips in very close proximity to each other, like this flower. You'll do your first chip as it's laid out, but when you're ready to start the next cut, you want to make sure that that first cut of the new chip is, a, is facing away from the ones already carved. So what that means is if I have a chip that I've already done, like this one right here, I'm going to end up wanting to start this, removing this chip here. But when I go in, I want my blade facing away from the last chip I've done. The reason why that's the case is if I were to come in from the other direction, this blade has uh, the potential to cross that ridge and undercut the design. And then I could lose that ridge altogether. So by starting on this side, I, I will have created a guide for which when I rotate the board and come from the other end, the knife, you're going to feel that trench that you make when you remove this chip. So getting right down to it, I, this, this was my last chip. I'm going to come in down here and just follow along that line. I don't really want to remove it because that ends up being the ridge for this negative design. And I come straight up to the point. And then I'm going to rotate my board. And start cutting. And you can already see that chip curling up. It wants to come out and I just taper off. This particular joint right here is another place where you're going to want to use that stacking method because I see one, two, three cuts coming right here alone. So what I actually did was I stopped short of that point that would have been right here because when I come through here, 
I'm already going to meet that point inadvertently. So I don't want to bring that point down right here and then potentially lose this ridge right here when I go to remove this piece. And then, then this is a bigger piece. Now you'll notice that the, this last cut didn't require me to remove a center before I mo removed the entire chip. And that's because this piece was narrow enough to where I could have taken my, my knife through and just do a, a single pass in each direction. Now this one, on the other hand, is a much bigger chip. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make a smaller cut that's going to mirror this design on the inside. So that the, when I mean by design, I'm talking about this particular shape right here that I'm tracing out with my knife. So I'm going to take my knife and I'm going to come across and I'm going to stop oh about two millimeters shy of this edge. I'm going to rotate my board and I'm going to come straight down. Once again, not going all the way to that point because this is the inside chip that I'm trying to remove. I'm going to rotate my board again. And go to the point where I just left off at. And I could hear the pop so I know I hit it. And out she came. So now that's that inner chip is gone, I could then proceed to cut the rest of the chip. So to do that, I'm just going to follow right along the line without crossing the line if I can help it. Because the line itself is the guide. I kind of look at it the same way I, I show my kids how to color. You want to try to stay inside the line so it looks nice and neat. But in this case, I want to make sure that I don't cross the line because by doing so I'll make the design larger than I intended because without that guideline visually it's going to look like one large chip. Sorry about that. I'm trying to stay inside the frame at the same time. So that chip just moved. I'm going to take my brush and remove anything that's loose. there's a piece right about here that hasn't quite released. Once I reach that point, this whole piece is going to pop right out. And I heard a pop, and there it is. Take my brush. So I was able to remove the majority of that piece. There's just a little bit that's kind of stuck right there. And I'm going to find the side that it's still attached to. 
just by using the tip of the knife and just follow I'm just following along my previous cuts because I don't want to make this deeper I just want to remove the chip that's still caught at the very bottom of this well and I'm sorry if this is a little bit jarring And so now that cut's been removed. So I'm just gonna keep going all the way around until I finish. Now there's a part of the flower here that has three little marks. And I'm gonna zoom in so that you can see that a little bit clearer better. Okay. So in Wayne Barton's book, he has he actually uses a second knife. He's, he uses two knives for everything. One of them is his carving knife, which doesn't look anything like the one that you're seeing right now. And then he's got a stab knife, which does exactly what it sounds like. And he will actually make impressions in, in some of his designs, and this is one of those spots. So if you get a chance and, you, and you're able to pick up a copy of one of his books, you'll see pictures demonstrating on exactly how to do that. Now, since I don't own a stab knife yet, I like to just remove the chips like I would anything else. And this is the only part of this design where ideally I am going to remove the black lines. So like this is still here and, and I was able to just pop that out because it was just resting there. Probably better to take the brush so I don't end up scratching the wood with my knife when I'm trying to remove. So essentially I'm just marking it. The chips are so small you can't even really see them. And it'll come out a lot clearer when you oil it at the very end. So once this flower is finished, it's gonna look more like this one. And let me zoom out so you can see it a little bit better. There we go. It's a really pretty design. It's really worth the effort, trust me on that one. So the end lesson here is that large chips take a, a bit more practice than your triangle chips. You'll, I imagine you'll pick up on the triangle chips a lot quicker because it's the same cut all the way around and there's, me, there's many designs you could do with that three-sided cut. So that's, that's typically one of the rudimentary skills that you'll pick up chip carving almost immediately. And then as you start getting interested in doing some of these designs as practice, you could work your way up to this design. Now this particular design that I actually have laid out here, it can't be more than a couple of inches. About two and three quarter inches across here. But the design can actually be made much larger. And I came across it in his book when I was designing a project I wanted to do on butternut. And I've never carved in butternut before. And I wasn't sure if I wanted to go with the, the original design that he proposed or, or something else. And so it really is a good idea to practice. I had a scrap board of butternut. I love the way butternut looks. It's, it's darker, but it cuts just as well as basswood. And as you can see, this design is significantly bigger, so much bigger cuts. The irony of it is that the space that I wanted to put this in is bigger yet. So it was really nice to be able to practice in a butternut board just to get a feel for it, but it was also additional practice for these larger cuts. And although I'm not entirely perfect at the moment, I believe that the more I do it, the better I'll get because that's just how practice works. And I, and I recommend doing it because it's just a lovely process. And 
I can't help but be happy when I'm finished. It's always a good idea to try new designs on practice boards just so that you get a feel for how to handle your knife as you're going around. Now this is an example of a busier design. Um, it's more geometric. I'm zooming in because I want to specifically show you exactly how similar a technique you're going to need compared to that flower. So when I was when I was showing you how to carve the flower, I talked about a stacking technique where if you have similar types of cuts coming to the same point, you don't want to bring each cut to that point because you risk undercutting and pulling off material you didn't mean to. So fans, as shown all the way around the perimeter of this, um, of this particular design, are the same and they're coming to single points all the way around. And so you risk the chance of cutting, and I know it's probably difficult to see because the wood's a bit darker, but right here I lost a little bit in that process because I came down too far. For the overall scheme of the design, you really can't tell, but it was an excellent learning experience. These cuts are much smaller than anything else that I've done in regards to non-three-sided chips, especially this part here. It's, it's challenging to see at this time, but when I oil it in the next section, Hopefully those pieces will come out more, but they're very intricate cuts and so you want to make sure that you're not coming in too deep because if your knife comes in too deep, it's going to cross over to some of these other ridges and then you're going to have gaping holes across. I really enjoyed this design because of all the nice little cuts and at the end you, you get this really intricate design that I didn't even think I was capable of doing and I just really enjoyed it. But the takeaway lesson here is just if you're going to do something new, practice. It doesn't have to be perfect. It doesn't even have to be perfect on your finished design. It's just a lot of fun to do and it's worth trying out. And at the end, I'm sure it's going to be beautiful. All right, so your carving's done. You removed any excess graphite that might have still been on your board after you finished carving. And you're ready for the really fun part. Um, I like to oil my carvings. You can already see a nice natural shadowing effect you get when you do chip carving, but the oil is going to bring it out that much more. You can also choose to stain it, depending on what you're making. It used to be that it was kind of unheard of to stain chip carvings like this. You, normally a coat of oil, maybe another coat of oil, does everything you could possibly want to do for it. but as popularity grew to do chip carving on what would be hardwoods, this staining became a nice option for basswood when you want it to look like something else. And the same thing goes for butternut. I don't really have any advice on how to go about doing that because I haven't really ventured into it. But if you're interested in staining, doing a practice run on a practice board like this and testing on this um, would probably save you a lot of grief down the road if you find that staining's not, not for the design you were going for. And in uh, Mr. Moore's book, the carving workbook I mentioned at the beginning, he has a whole section uh, showing you how to go about testing different stains. Um, I didn't even realize there was different types, like the gel type stains become real popular now. So I'd recommend checking out some of those works to get an idea of how to go about doing those. But as of right now, I'm ready to start oiling. And I like to use a Minwax product, Wipe On Poly, it's fast drying. I use the clear satin. And I like to apply it liberally, but it is it does dry very quickly. So if you put on too much, you wanna make sure you wipe it before, before it dries. Otherwise you'll get this sticky surface that you don't want. And then you just start working it in. And already you're starting to see those lines pop. And the more I put onto this, you're going to see that shadowing effect heightened. Then 
This really is my favorite part. It's, it's like the carving is coming to life. Now this particular design has some deep cuts so you can see that despite how hard I'm rubbing it's just not getting in there. And I, sometimes I like to use a, a sponge brush just to kind of help work that oil in. I used to use Q-tips which seems like a bad idea for obvious reasons but I guess I wasn't thinking about it the cotton fibers can come off and stick to the wood. It didn't really happen to me too often, but once I got a hold of these, I found that this is a much better alternative. And you can just see how that's really brought this carving to life. Sometimes it takes more than one coat to really, you know, work it in. But you don't really know that until you let it dry. And then all of a sudden this little practice piece doesn't look like practice anymore. And I think that's why chip carving is so appealing and, and why it really is a hobby that anyone can do. The, these chips don't have to look perfect to look beautiful. And that's one of my favorite parts. So I'll take my rag back and I'll just kind of wipe the excess. Try to make sure I hit everywhere. And then check that out. Just beautiful. It's really hard not to be biased toward Wayne Barton's designs when you see something like this. It's just beautiful and I thank him for his talent and his dedication to the craft. And just for fun, let's do the thistle too. Now you'll recall that I had mentioned that the cuts were very deep and I bet they're really going to pop in this in this setting. And I'm not encouraging you to make deep, overly deep cuts because that's still not a great idea. But since I didn't distort the overall design of the thistle, it's still going to come out looking really nice. And I just love how the shadowing effect just comes through. I mean, you, get, you can already see it as you're carving, which is its own reward. But to put that finishing touch on it, it is just, it's just wonderful. So now I've shown you how to do this on basswood. And it's the same exact technique for butternut. But since this is a lot of fun, we're going to do this again. So here's the flower design, and I'm going to zoom out just a touch because the design was bigger than the last two. This has had one coat of oil before, shortly after I finished it, but it did lighten up quite a bit, so I think it's due for another. And butternut is substantially darker than basswood, and when it's stained, it you can make it look like just about anything you want. I s mistaken butternut for black walnut and oak and sometimes cherry. So it may be worth looking into uh, different staining techniques in the future. But for me, I think just oiling it is its own reward it's such a beautiful wood. This wood in general, butternut that is, has a bit more grain that shows compared to basswood. Basswood's so appealing because any design you put into it, intricate or simple, isn't going to compete with the overall grain of the wood. Now you'll notice on my practice board you saw some dark streaks in the basswood when I was working on the thistle and the flower. And that's ultimately why I decided to use that board as a practice board because it wasn't really something I wanted to incorporate into a more permanent design um, for like a jewelry box or something. 
but depending on what you're looking for that could be just the ticket with butternut I really like all the extra grain marks that come with it because I feel like it, it just adds to the overall nature of the wood and the design I chose for it and I have a cherry kitchen and the cross I showed earlier in this demonstration that my grandfather made is made out of butternut but with the cherry trim you see a lot of the red hues and the stain that he had chosen which is really neat and I plan on making a recipe book holder and I've got it just about entirely laid out but the center design I think I may end up going with these petals versus that geometric design I had shown you I haven't quite settled on the answer yet I might do a few other uh, round designs just to see where I go with it but I don't think I'm going to stain it I think oiling it is going to be all it's going to need and it's okay if it doesn't match my cherry kitchen because it gives it a little bit of character just standing out on its own the board that I'm laying out for that book holder is the same board that this practice board came from and so it's going to have all of these elements that that's popping out here and that board as well which makes me extremely motivated and excited to do and as soon as I finish it I'll post it on Facebook so y'all can see it So there's those those two images before I move on to my last image that I'm gonna oil I had mentioned earlier when I was carving the flower pattern about the stacking method and how you don't want to bring your chips all the way to the center line I want to show you on the basswood piece why that's okay I'm gonna zoom in just a little bit more because I really just want you to see that center part of the design this is the center and you can see how some of the chips come right up to it and some of them hang back but you have to look closely otherwise you don't really notice and this is why that stacking method really works had I gone to the center with each of these eight petals that are shown here I might have lost that and granted, I would have made lemonade and probably turned it into a clock because all the clocks would need a hole here to put the timepiece in. I really didn't want to do that. So you can see how nicely this all came out. And how oiling it just really brings the carving to life. I don't think I can say that enough. It's just, it's just an exciting part of this entire process. And really worth a try. I really hope that after this presentation, you're inspired to get some materials and, and give it a whirl yourself. And then this one, this one's one of my favorite too, just because I just didn't think it was going to come out so well. And it's not that I underestimated myself by any means, it's just it looked so complicated. But once you get on a rhythm, it's just it's so easy to lose yourself in carving. And I think with all that's going on in the world right now and how we're all cooped up inside, this is an excellent hobby to get into. You don't have to move necessarily, so it's great on rainy days when you're stuck inside anyway. Just to sit down, listen to some music, and carve. The hours will go very quickly. So I'm hoping that after I'm finished with this one you can see just all the little cuts that it took to get there and I haven't quite decided which which is easier the the little cuts or the big cuts and I, and I think it really just depends on what you're up to because as you get your rhythm they all seem to kind of equate out I have to admit the larger cuts are still pretty challenging for me in regards to maintaining the same depth throughout the entire carving but that'll come with time 
The other reason why I wanted to oil this and wanted to show you some of the smaller cuts is because some of the rudimentary cuts that I discussed earlier are actually embedded in this design. I mentioned the fans earlier, but if you look here and follow the blade, these are actually negative diamonds. You can see, hopefully, the triangles right here. Those are your, your three-sided cuts. And you can see that line in between them. And when you carve out that border for the negative di diamond, that's what it's going to look like. And uh, Mr. Barton put that all the way around in his design. And although they're different sizes, you can see more of these triangle cuts throughout. So chip carving is a lot of fun to do and it's really easy to immerse yourself into this hobby and you really don't need a whole lot to get started. So from the planning phase all the way to the finishing work, I find that even my practice runs turn out looking pretty cool. I find this relaxing because when I do this type of work, I, I don't find myself thinking about other things. And I hope you enjoyed this presentation and venture out to try it yourself. I want to finish it off with some pictures of some finished projects my grandfather and I completed and some sources for the designs that you were, got to enjoy today. And I want to thank Toledo Woodcraft for the opportunity to share this with you. And I hope this encourages you to try this out and I'd love to see some of your designs. Thank you.